Mark. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you. I, uh, I'm glad to be back. It feels good to be back here. I really like this church. Um, this is my third seminar that I've done here. I, I've done one per year at the beginning of each year, so yeah. I'm glad you invited me back. Um, that's, that's nice. I'm glad to be here, and I and one thing I like about the church is it's it's very you all take uh, the message of getting people ready for what's coming very seriously, right? We want to live the gospel. We want to get people ready. We want to help share the three angels' messages with people, which is very important. Um, and so I'm I'm happy to be here. I'm thankful to be here. And uh, I did want to say one thing real quick about the, the testimony that the sister shared this morning for those of you who are in the lesson study before this service. Um, that was amazing. Um, if you heard that, what, some of the things that are going on overseas that we in America don't realize because we're sort of, uh, we don't get all of that news of some of the just amazing things that are happening that are warning signs to us what is coming, what is coming. So uh, a couple years ago, my series was on the three angels' messages and getting the messages out. Uh, last year, we took a different turn because it's, it's important to get the message out, but it's also important to have a walk with God, amen? Because you can know all the prophecies and you can know all the doctrines, but if you don't have a walk with God, it really doesn't really amount to much. Um, it's not real. It's not like it's flowing through you. It's something you just learn and then share. And so we talked about a practical walk with God, spending time in the Word, spending time in prayer, spending time sharing our message, the gospel. Um, and today and this weekend, uh, we're talking about something a little bit different, and um, it goes along with the text that Mark just read, which is a strange text when you think about it. Be, therefore, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The doves part we get, you know, okay, Doves, we want to be like doves, that's peaceful. But the wisest serpent's part seems a little odd at first. So we're going to dig into that. Um, and uh, if you would, just we'll have one little quick prayer again before we start. Again, Lord, we ask your blessings uh, on this congregation. Any influence that's not of you, we ask to be pushed aside. We want your holy angels to dwell here. And um, please, as Mark prayed, help me to Remember the things you brought to my mind to share with this particular congregation and these saints. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So I wanted to start with a riddle. And this, the, the answer to this riddle is going to help you to understand the whole theme of what we're talking about with regard to this idea of serpents and doves. And it'll make sense, I promise you. Those of you who weren't here last night, I'm going to do a little bit of a review so you won't be totally behind. Um, they did record it so you can see that. But here is, here's the riddle, and if you know the answer to this riddle, I want you to do me a favor. Don't answer it right away, okay? If you've heard this before, because you may have, do us all a favor, and let others who haven't heard it try to, try to see if they can solve it. I'll let it go for just a little bit, and if we, if we can't get anybody, then I'll say, all right, any of you who know it, answer it. If nobody knows it, I will share. So here it is. I want you to imagine for a moment. You are on a trail in the woods, up in the mountains. You're walking along, it's just you, and at the top of the mountain, you see something that, that uh, seems odd to you, and uh, you want to go check it out. It's kind of off in the distance, and so you walk over toward it, and you, you're looking in the window of a cabin. You're looking right in the window, and on the floor of the cabin is a dead man. He's, he's laying there dead. You know he's dead. You can see he's actually been there a while. He's not breathing. You immediately pick up, uh, pull out your cell phone, and you call the police, and you report how he died. So the question I have for you is, and the answer is in the story, how did he die? Does anyone want to take a guess who hasn't heard this before? How did he die? Anyone know? Nobody knows? All right, listen carefully. I'm going to tell it to you again, because the answer of how he died is in the story. The clue is right there. It's, it's clear how he died. So you're walking on a trail in the woods up in the mountains, like the beautiful mountains that we have here. And at the top of the mountain, there's a dead man laying in the, in the, on the floor of this cabin. Uh, you don't know that as you're walking along. You're just thinking you're having a nice walk up the mountains. 
So, but when you see in the distance this, this uh, you know, you're curious about, about that. You walk over there and you look into the cabin window and you see on the floor of the cabin is this dead man. And um, you immediately know how he died. I mean, it's, it's very clear. So you call the police and you want them to come out and, and take a look at the situation. So how did he die? Yes. Correct. <laughs> Very good. Not only is he a great piano player, <laughs> by the way, that uh, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus is already a beautiful song, but that, that thing you did at the end there, I, was, I looked over at Mark and I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, I love great piano players. Yes, the cabin of an airplane. Very good. Um, how many of you thought it was a cabin like you see on the cover of Log Cabin Syrup, and you're picturing those logs in the... Yeah, and you're saying, well, well, how would we possibly know that? The reason you didn't guess it is because you made an assumption that the word cabin here meant a log cabin. And so I want you to keep that in mind. Yes, when you see this and you look inside, you pretty much know how he died. Sometimes if people don't get it, I'll tell them, here's a clue. He shouted out to, on the microphone with, before he went down, I'm losing cabin pressure, and they, they figure it out at that point. All right. So conversing with serpents and doves, um, this is in the works right now. I actually, I wrote uh, another book. I've already written a book called um, Heaven, Think on These Things. And um, some of you have that book. I, I talked about it a little bit a couple of years ago. This is a new one. It's not out yet. But one of the things I realized is as Christians, when we want to, there's two things to our Christian walk. One is when we're talking to people about just everyday things. They still are watching what we're doing and how we treat them. And the other is when we're actually sharing the gospel. And both of those have their own uh, sticking points. For one thing, when you are sharing the gospel, you're obviously going to get pushback, right? Have any of you done the door-to-door -door thing because there's a seminar coming up and, you know, uh, maybe it's Doug Bass or something you want to share and they get, you get the funny look, who's behind this thing, you know? And sometimes you get real, real pushback. And so um, how we interact with people... And we think about what the sister shared about what's going on overseas. We have a message to get out. We don't have a lot of time, right? I mean, the, the Bible says, and the dragon, I mean, and the lamb like beast will speak as a dragon before all things will, will, will go to pot. And that's coming. And so we really need to, be, we need to be using Bible principles in our communication one on one. So there's the spiritual side of getting the gospel out. We don't want to get into fights with people and debate them and argue and turn them off. But then there is the other side that sometimes can even be harder, and that is how we treat people in our own homes or in our workplace on a day-to-day -day basis. When they do those things that just make us so irritated and we want to put them in their place, and we, uh, we don't have that combination of the serpent and the dove, right? You got that, that both together. So you have the wisdom to speak when you should speak, you're not too timid to speak up. We need to speak up. But at the same token, you do it in a way that is harmless. Now, that's a supernatural thing. We don't naturally have the, bil the ability to do this. We naturally want to defend our position and prove the other person wrong. Or if we're more like on the side of the dove that doesn't have the side of the, the wisdom of the serpent, we want to capitulate and just keep the peace. Right? I, just, let's just, I just want everyone happy. I just want everyone happy. So that's in the works. Pray for me as I'm finishing that. You're getting some of the highlights. There's a lot more to it than even these three parts. And like I said, if you missed part one last night, I'll be giving a quick review here at the beginning of this, but also if you go to your, the church's website, you can get that. It's been recorded. Um, and if you want more information overall, you can go to this, my website, conversingwithserpentsanddoves.com. Uh, if you forget that, it's the name of the sermon today and then put a .com on it, so pretty easy. So this is part two, um, Judge Not. And we're going to look at, you know, the first part was, was the introduction to the problem that we have. So the first part was the what. And I'll share with that, I'll review that in a minute. Today we're going to look at the, at the why. Well, why does that happen? Why do we find ourselves going in the wrong direction and, and going off track, particularly with people that we love and we don't want to treat them that way? And five minutes later we go, why did I say those things? Why did I say it like that? All right, and then this afternoon we're going to get into the how. Okay, so in each of these, there's principles, there's a little bit of practicality, but the afternoon after potluck is going to be the actual steps.
that both, both scriptures and science back up that is, is the most effective way to have a conversation when the emotions start rising. That's the issue. If you're talking about where should we go for, uh, for dinner tonight, that's probably not a, where you'll need to use these unless you really, the two of you have opposite tastes and that's a big deal in your family. This is really more for when emotions are, are getting high, how we can interact with others. So, again, the, uh, the scripture is, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, and he says, Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves, to be both. Now, one of the things that um, I shared last night is, this is what I do for a living. I actually teach these topics of interpersonal skills and leadership skills, so I could talk about this all day long. In fact, it's going to be hard for me to stop here on time, I probably won't on time, but I'll try to do it close to on time because I love this stuff. I will follow people in my classes at work out to the parking lot and say, I'm not done yet. i got to share more because I'm also an extrovert. But this is backed up by science, but the science is actually backed up by scriptures. God's principles are eternal, amen? So God told human beings in his word how to interact with each other. Interpersonal skills are all through scripture. But in today's world, we want science to show that it's real and so forth. And so when you work in corporate America like I do, you, you can't go and have a group of 30 people in your class and say, let's talk about Jesus and how Jesus is the solution. Because here, we know it's true. We know that Jesus is the solution. But when I'm dealing with people of all different faiths, atheists included, I, I, uh, we take an approach that is getting them to the science of it and we leave out the spiritual side. And I always feel like I'm, I'm getting people maybe to second base, third base, but I can't really, you know, they, they aren't transformed. Science doesn't transform anybody. Jesus Christ does. And if you have that transformation, the steps that we're going to look at uh, this morning and this afternoon will be, um, you'll be empowered to do them through Christ because there's steps that he tells us to do. So you'll see as I go through this, I'll talk about science, but I'll talk about scripture also, and I'll show how they fit together. Um, now, there's a book that I highly recommend called The Desire of Ages. You, you may have heard of it. Um, it is a very, very good book, a commentary on the life of, of Jesus. And here is what we see on page 353 of that book. Behold, said Jesus, I send you... Now, pay close attention because this is what, this is what we're talking about for how we can have this, right? Behold, said Jesus, I send you forth, forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now watch this. Christ himself did not suppress one word of truth. Oh, I can't say that. Oh, I can't talk about this stuff. They'll be offended. You know, I had one guy tell me one time, we got to stop talking about the, uh, you know, the um, investigative judgment because you know, we're just turning people off you know, and all that. And I said, well, what's the, if we're not going to share what God has shared with us, why are we even out sharing anything, right? And, and so Christ did not suppress one word of truth, but he spoke it always in love. He exercised the greatest tact and thoughtful, kind attention in his intercourse with the people. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not... Now watch the balance here, right? So you got some people that lean more toward, I'm going to put people in their place, and others that lean more toward, I'm going to keep the peace and not really say anything. Watch Jesus' perfect balance of the two. He fearlessly, he fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. This is supernatural. You and I do not possess this. Can we have it? Does Jesus offer this to us? Absolutely. And he offers it to us through him dwelling in us, but also in reading the word of how to interact with other people. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you this morning and this afternoon. So first, we'll do a quick review of part one. Like I said, this will be a quick review. This is, um, if some of this doesn't make sense to you because I'm not fleshing it out, watch the video from last night because I don't want to take up too much time. But one of the things I've learned as a trainer, and I, again, I've been doing this for, uh, for 15 years as a profession, is that you all, you all will probably remember about 10 to 15% of the things that I share with you today. Now, as one who prepared this material, that could be depressing. And you think about how much of it is lost, right? 
So I want to help choose for you what that 10% is. So you'll see me repeating things throughout. And here's one. When you're going to have a conversation with someone, it could be about spiritual things, it could be about a disagreement you have, um, you have a goal, right? You picture yourself having the conversation. You say, I'm going to go talk to Joe about this. And so I want you to remember this little poem. You had a goal right in plain sight, but then you shifted, once you start talking to this person, you shifted left or right. Now, what do we mean by that, shifted left or right? Well, you are wired so that if something happens, if a, if a bear comes after you in these woods over here, if a, if a, a truck is driving towards you on a, on a highway and they swerve into your lane head on, God has given you a reaction with your amygdala that causes you to go to fight or flight. That's a defense technique. It's good. You, you, none of us would be alive right now if we didn't have it, because we've had many times, you've all had many times where you took action, and uh, that's great for survival in a physical world. It's not so great with conversations, where your brain says, defend yourself, or shut down and, and, and go to silence. So fight, stand your ground, defend your position, attack, dig in, persevere. Flight, give way, retreat, discard, remove yourself, give up, move on. You know, I'm, I'm not going to address this issue. Keep the peace. And that's what we do. We have this fight or flight mode, and it, it comes from a fear, right? Like I said, when it's in the physical world, it's a fear you'll have physical harm. When it's in these conversations and emotions get high and someone starts to argue with you, your brain doesn't differentiate and say, well, this is no big deal. You still have a fear. You have a fear of being wrong, a fear of being your reputation being hurt, a fear of, of letting them get away with things and so forth. And so the fear causes you to go to fight or flight. You have these emotions that surge. So I have a saying. You can jot this down if you want or hope maybe you'll remember it. But emotions are like fire. They're a wonderful servant but a horrible master. Now think about your emotions. We all have emotions. If you see a homeless person or a child being uh, mistreated, you have emotions that have sympathy. You have sorrow. You have mercy. You want to help. Those are good. And if you are in charge of them, they're a wonderful servant. They can help us. What are some things that fire have done as a servant of humankind over the years? What's something it's good for? Food, like cooking, right? What else? I heard warmth. What else? And light. Those are the three main ones. There's other things. But yeah, for thousands of years, human beings have used fire to help them as a servant. So I want you to imagine that you're, you're cooking, uh, you, you have a, you're having a, you've planned this romantic dinner for your, your special significant other, right? And so you're going to, you say, look, uh, this, I'm, doing, I'm preparing this. You just relax. I'm going to prepare it all. So you go and you, you, you've even got like your little your, your, uh, dining room table and you put this candle out there. You light the candle and you say, ooh, you know, I'm going to make this special. And then you go in the kitchen and you say, all right, I'm going to finish up in here. And, and so this, this special person comes into the kitchen and you say, and you say, oh, I hope you like what I'm making. And then you're kind of, you know, gazing into each other's eyes like you normally do and, and, and think about this meal. And, and while you're in there, your cat decides that it likes the, what's going on on the table because there's this light up there. So the cat jumps up there and I immediately realizes it's fire and doesn't want to mess with it, so it jumps off. When the cat jumps off, this candle, it's one of those thick wick candles, it falls onto the floor and it just kind of rolls gently over to the edge of the wall where your drapes are hanging just above. Well, you're in there too enamored by your, your, your significant other. I mean, they are amazing. I mean, if you're sitting next to them, you know this is true, right? They're amazing. And you're, you're just not even, you didn't hear the thing fall. You don't even smell the smoke. It's just, I, this person is so great. Finally, you walk out, and you see that the drapes are on fire, and now the flames are going up uh, into the heating system, the air system. Your walls are on fire. And now the fire is no longer a servant to make a romantic setting. It is now in charge. It is your master, and you've got to get help. You've got to call the fire department do something. My, my, uh, my mom and my stepdad lived in Paradise, California in 2018 when uh, you all probably know what happened. It was world news. Uh, very rare that nearly the entire town burns to the ground. And I went to high school there for a couple years. And um, it, it's unrecognizable. Uh, Paradise was known for its many, many pine trees throughout. 
And in, in, in many of the sections of paradise that you go now, it's, it's, uh, it's, looks, uh, it's unrecognizable. The trees are gone, so it doesn't even look the same at all. And um, they actually, when the fire was creeping along through down the roads of the perfect storm of the, the extreme heat, very, very dry. It hadn't rained in a long time and high winds. Uh, they, could, they couldn't stop it. It was unbelievable. Um, they were on vacation when that happened. So they couldn't go and get special things out of their house like and then poems that my mom wrote. My mom had a book of poems that she had written. Um, all of that totally destroyed. And what's interesting about that is people had asked, this is a side issue here, but I, I, maybe someone needs to hear this. When they got news, their house was still standing. And so they were told, are you aware that the street, Pence Road, that street, the houses are just going one after the other. And they were down in Southern California, and they couldn't believe it. So immediately there was this call for prayer to save that house. Lord, please save the house. Please. You know, we can't lose everything. And then one by one, boom, boom, the houses. And a lot of times we like hearing a story about how the fire went around and then it kept destroying homes. Uh, that didn't happen. Now I want you to think for a minute if that prayer had been answered. If God had said, okay, you're asking for it, I'll do it. So the house doesn't get hurt at all. But every house in the entire town, practically two-thirds of it, I think, every house on that street gone. My parents would not have had any insurance money. They would, have, they would have had to stay there. They couldn't have sold it because who would buy it? They'd have no neighbors. They'd have no stores. So an answer to the prayer would have meant a life, even to this day, of misery. And, uh, and, um, and they'd been wanting to move to Tennessee anyway because we, we live there. And so it just sped things up, <laughs> right? <laughs> Now, I don't tell them that, but uh, no, actually, my mom's at a place where she can a little bit joke about it, but that is what happens when fire takes over. And I want you to imagine when you're having a conversation with someone and something happens that you don't like and you're kind of going back and forth, you've, you've been there. You've been there where your emotions are in charge. They take over and you are um, doing things that you normally would not do. That you almost feel like, that's not me. What am I doing? Because it, it is now your master. Your emotions have become your master. And so though some of us lean more toward the, the, the serpent, you know, without, the, uh, without the, the, the harmlessness of the dove, and others lean more toward the dove without uh, the wisdom uh, and the, the ability to take care of issues as the serpent, we just want peace and we want avoidance. All of us have some of this, each of these in us, right? Those of you who are married, someone here may be married to one that's more on the dove side. Um, you've seen that transformation when you push that person too far and they, they, <laughs> that gentle dove is not there for a little bit. Um, so we all have both of these in us. And the Bible talks about this. In Proverbs 4, verse 27, it says, Don't turn to the right or to the left, but keep your feet from evil. Right? That goal that you have in mind. The Bible says Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem, right? This was when he was headed toward the crucifixion. There would be no distractions, right? Jesus, obviously, we, we know from the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was, was praying, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. But then he added what? Not my will, but thine be done. And so Jesus, it says, he set his face toward Jerusalem and, and nothing was going to change it. This is what God is saying about when we are to be addressing issues and having conversations that are beneficial and effective. We want to do this. We don't want to get pulled away by our emotions of anger and proving others wrong or our emotions of, well, I guess I, I, guess I won't say anything, right? Did Queen Esther go to a dove whenever it came time for her to speak up? No. She had that wisdom to go and talk to the king and say, I realize if he doesn't want me to, to come in here, I haven't, had, I haven't had an invitation, that I could be killed. A dove would never do that. She, was, she had the perfect balance because she didn't go in and demand things of the king, did she? She went in and said, I want to talk to you about some things. The serpent and the dove combined. She spoke when she needed to speak for such a time as this. Have you and I been put on this planet right now? Out of the thousands of years we could have been born, were we put here now for a reason? What's our reason? We're at the end. You can read about yourself in the book of Revelation. You've heard me say before, I don't like the saying that uh, raise up the little children well because they'll finish the work. I don't like that saying. I'd rather look around to our 90-year-olds and say, hey, let's go help them because they're going to finish the work. 
I want to go home in the next few years. I don't want to say, let's put it off for 30, 40 years. Let's get out of here. What if we all said, let's get out of here? And we were serious. Instead of like the majority of Israel, when they were captive in Babylon, who began to be acclimated to the customs and the culture of Babylon, and they didn't really want to leave. The majority stayed in Babylon. We don't want to stay. So the question is, when we shift to left or right, and we had a goal in mind to have that conversation, and we got distracted, why do we do this? That's what this is about. We're going to talk about that in this one. We talked about John Gottman last night. All right, quiz time. Remember, I am, I am a teacher by trade. So, who remembers John Gottman, for those of you who weren't there, Dr. John Gottman has done research, and he can tell, he looks for a certain thing in couples when they disagree and argue, that is the red flag that they are headed toward a divorce. He's only right about 92% of the time. So, he's not got a perfect track record, but he actually is amazing with this. You can get his books on Amazon.com. He's got several. One of them is called why uh, um, reasons for success and failure, of, why marriages fail or succeed. And he talks about this. He's done a lot of research. Who remembers, and this isn't just for marriage, by the way. This is how we treat each other, your coworkers, your uh, relatives. Who remembers what the thing is that he was looking for that's a red flag? Go ahead. That's right. With, with, when you have contempt toward them and attack their character, you're not talking about, you know, Joe, I'm tired of you leaving your, your, uh, your tools in the yard. And leaving your tools in the yard makes it difficult for me to, to mow and all that. It's, Joe, you're lazy. You're selfish. I've asked you three times. You don't even care. See, once you do that, you've changed it. You've put that knife in there, and now you're leaving a scar. We had a story over here about the nails. Perfect. There's a lot of things today that lined up really well with what we're talking about. I, was, I loved it when he talked about the nails. When you treat people bad, it's like putting a nail in, you pull it out. When you attack someone's character, the research shows you do leave a scar. Because if you tear someone up and you say you're, you're awful, you're lazy, you only care about yourself, and you go back later and you go, you know, I, was, I shouldn't have said that. I was just because I was mad. What do they think? When you say, I was just mad, I didn't mean it. What do they think? That you, you shared what you really thought because you were then you had enough emotion to come out and say it. Now you may not mean it, but try convincing them of that. And so you've got these these holes it makes. Even with a woman's hammer, you still make those holes. <laughs> okay, for those watching this that's recorded years from now, I'm referencing something earlier. I'm not making fun of women's hammers. <laughs> the women's hammers are just fine. It was in our children's story. All right. So these are biblical principles we're going to look at. And think about this. In Psalm 32, verse 8, God tells us. He's going to help us with this. He tells us, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Um, remember Obadiah talking about his friend. You tried to reach him and tell him about Christ after you got out of the partying scene and all that. That's very difficult. How do you do this, right? You're trying to reach this person how do you not tell them, well, you're still doing bad things that I gave up, and they think, oh, you're better than me, or kind of downplay some of the things they're still doing? How do you do that? God says, I will instruct thee and teach thee how to do that. And you don't possess the ability to do it. You don't. Only God can give you that. Amen? And you've got to remember that, because here's what we're guilty of. I've done this so many times. I'll think about someone I have to have that conversation with. I need to address the issue, and I think, I got this. And I know what I'm doing, because I know I'm right. In fact, when I show them these things here, I know I'm right. So, uh, Joe, let's have a talk. And then I don't realize, Joe has something, he's going to come back with me. And it throws me, and I wasn't ready. So we're going to look at some of, these, some of these principles. Why the shift of goals, the goal of resolving an issue, turns to the goal of proving them wrong, making them look bad, or the goal of a, a dove capitulating, I change, I'll just, okay, never mind, I shouldn't have brought it up. Why does it do that? What causes the fear? That's what we're going to look at. What causes the fear? We already know from last night, that it's fear that causes the fight or flight. But now we're going to get a step earlier. What causes the fear? You may be a little bit surprised. What causes it is a, something our brain does very quickly. When we play, we play tricks on ourselves with truth versus assumption. Now, 
all of you, or most of you anyway, except at least one brother who, who solved it, that it was a, a plane, you made an assumption. And there's lots of, these are called lateral thinking puzzles, which I love. Some of them are very well written. I really like this one. But you make an assumption, okay? So I'll give you an example that I use sometimes that, and tell me what you think here. Now, it always, once I say that, that I'm giving you an example, you all have been primed now to not think of the obvious thing. I realize that. But if you hadn't heard all that, what would you think with this scenario? So I'm, I'm uh, teaching a group of new managers, right? Uh, no, I take that back. I'm teaching, I'm teaching a group of managers on some ongoing training at where I work, OK? And um, one of them has a reputation of being a micromanager, right? It's just that's kind of like that's the thing he's known for, is that he's always checking out. Are you done with that? Would it, you know, check with me before you do this. So and that's something, of course, we have to deal with. And um, so I'm doing this class to help these managers, some of them have been there for 20 years, to get better at various things, coaching and one-on-ones with their direct reports. And I say, now, how many of you understand how really dangerous and damaging it is to micromanage your people? How many of you understand that? And uh, some people raise their hands. And so we start talking about, about it. And, and I say, yeah, micromanaging is really one of the worst things that a manager can do. And suddenly that manager gets up. He gets up and he actually stomps out to the door. And then he bashes the door open with his hands. He doesn't just leave the room. He's bashing it open with his hands. And you hear him leaving. And then in the, you hear him in the parking lot peeling out. <laughs> and I'm, you're, I'm sitting here going, and it was, we're sitting here discussing micromanaging problems. Now, yeah, he has a reputation of it. But oh, man, why did he go out the door like that? Why do you think? What, what would you think if you're sitting in that room and you know his reputation and you see me saying? Yeah, you would assume that he was upset about what you did, but he could have had an emergency. Someone could have, you know, yeah. accident. Right. But if it happened right when I say micromanaging is a huge problem and he's got a reputation, you're going to think this guy is known for that. What a. So then I say, okay, I'm calling him up. You know, we can't have this. Call him up. Joe, what's going on? Well, what do you mean? What do you mean? What's going on? He's even even then he's kind of like kind of short with me, and I say, this thing of running out of my class. Come on! I mean, I didn't say your name. Yes, micromanaging the problem, but I wasn't. I didn't humiliate you. And he goes, oh, what, what? What? What are you talking about? I said, well, what do you mean? What I'm talking about? You stormed out of the room like a big baby. He goes, what? What do you mean? I said, when I said micromanaging, he goes, look, I, I didn't hear any of that. I got a I got a text from my wife saying that my son was in a car accident and to come down right away. I didn't catch any of that. So, so I got to go. Click. Now, how do I feel? <laughs> Appropriately shamed, because it's like, what was I thinking? When you get in a conversation with someone and the emotions start to rise, what you'll find is it's easy for you to make an assumption about why they said what they said. Now, eventually, it gets to the point where you're, you're just, if you're attacking each other's characters, it, it is, the intention is to hurt. And that's when it really starts to escalate. We were talking last night. Dr. Gottman said that one of the biggest issues that couples have that lead to uh, major issues and some of their worst arguments that are damaging to their relationship is how to load the dishwasher. <laughs> I see some people looking at their spouses right now. How to load the dishwasher. Now, I will say no couple has ever gotten mad because they feel like loading the dishwasher is a huge thing. What, in, what inevitably happens is when you're disagreeing over any small thing like that, one of the two will attack the other one's character in some way. Oh, you just think you know everything. Well, you, you know, what it does is when you attack someone's character, it causes them to think about something about your character. It's, it's, it's a natural thing. And so they have to, come, they have to get back at you. And, um, and this is a problem. This is obviously a problem when, when we you know, approach things this way. Truth versus assumption. So we're going to look at this. What is truth? Okay. What is the truth? When you're talking about having a conversation with someone and you're wanting them to understand something, a lot of times we confuse truth with what our opinion is. The two almost get blended in. So truth is a set of facts. Assumption is what I decide those facts mean about your character or motive. So if I were to go and talk to HR about our friend that had a kid in a car accident, what would I tell them? 
he, he ran out the door, he, he, kicked, he, uh, he, he slammed, you know, he slammed the opening of the door to make it open, he hit the wall, he peeled out. Are those facts? Yeah, those are facts. Those are facts. I'm not making any of that up. But the assumption is why I think he did that. And so there's so many examples of this. And I had one guy who, when I was teaching this a few years back, he said, you know what? And this wasn't at a church. This was in corporate America. He goes, you know what? If I had heard this nine years ago, I would still be married. Because you're right. That is exactly what we did to each other. And he said, I was guilty of it more than she was. It's just so natural. You don't care. You're so lazy. You don't even care if our kids go to school. You don't care if our son ends up homeless. These kinds of attacks. You never listen, right? All you care about is yourself. This sort of a thing. And so my goal shifts mid-conversation because I don't like what I assume your motive to be. I'm going to talk to you about something. You tell me something. Another example we had last night. Hey, we're at work. I'm talking to Joe from another department. I say, Joe, our department wants to work with your department on this project. If we could get this going, it'd be really good. And Joe says, with you guys? You kidding me? You guys get everything late. You never, it seems like nobody works down there. And now my goal, that it was originally very, very centered on working with Joe's department, slowly goes over to, is that right? Really? And I start thinking of things wrong with Joe's department. It is as natural as can be. And that shift is almost unnoticeable. It happens almost immediately, and we still think we're on track. So I want you to think about the HR test. This is a good way, and we have scripture to back this up, but I want to I share with you the HR test, human resources. Now, I work in human resources. Um, no, I'm not the side that does the firing or any of that. I'm the good side. We do the classes. <laughs> we help you get better uh, rather than firing you. But I want you to think about the HR test. Now, if, if you were my coworker, right, and you said, I can't stand working with this guy. Carl, is he's got a bad attitude. He's got a bad attitude. Nobody likes working with him. He's hard to get along with, right? I got those three things. So you go to HR about me, and you say, I need you to write Carl up. We're all fed up with him. And HR gets out their pen and says, OK, what you got? Well, he's got a bad attitude. What's HR going to say? Yeah, like, bad attitude, what does that mean? Well, nobody likes him. Well, why do they not like him? Because he's hard to get along with. <laughs> what does that mean? HR is not going to put up with that. They're going to keep saying, like you said, brother, what did Carl do? Because what you're doing when you go to HR to tell on me about bad attitude, I don't get along with people, I'm not carrying my weight, are things that are your interpretation of what I'm thinking, not what I'm doing. And so HR will say, what did he actually do? And you say, he threw a chair at me. And they say, now we got something. All right. Carl threw chair on this date. If it can be seen with a camera or heard with a recorder, that's a fact, right? That is a behavior. So when you're getting into this argument, think about Dr. John Gottman. As long as you focus on a behavior, you're not cutting them and turning that knife, like he says, when you attack their character. That's the difference. Not easy to do. It's easy to go from the issue. Let's say this bottle is the issue. It's easy to take your eyes off the issue that you're discussing and go to them, why they are the problem. And that is what I want you to remember. One of the practical tips here, we're going to give principles and also practicalities, is that when you are having the conversation, I want you to think about, am I discussing facts here, or am I accusing this person? Just think about that. It doesn't matter what the conversation is. It could be you're sharing the gospel, and they come back at you. Instead of you saying, well, you people don't even read your Bibles. So instead of that, you say, I, I hear what you're saying. Let's discuss this first. You see the difference? When you go to them and what's wrong with them, you automatically start to lose. You automatically start to lose. And I'll tell you another little secret. Research backs this up. Think about a Jeep. I have a Jeep, OK? And so you go four-wheeling in Jeeps. And one of the things that can cause you problems when you get too far out there is that your, your, your tires, how many of you ever had your car, truck, whatever, where your tires are spinning in the mud? You've had that? I had it happen to me in my Ford Fiesta a couple years ago at Christmas. 
And uh, it was when I was running errands, and I went down this one street, and I tried to turn around, and I, and I did. I got stuck. And I was like, there's no way I'm calling anyone that I know or relatives on this. <laughs> And admit that I'm stuck here. So I, I tried everything. I took, my, I took my floor mats and put them under there and started forward or reverse. It's a stick shift. I was going forward, backwards, forward, back. Oh, I said, Lord, please, <laughs> please help me. All of a sudden, a police comes down the street. This street was in the middle of nowhere. And I thought, OK, so the neighbor's called because there's some crazy guy out here that, that is messing around. And he goes, what's up? And I said, someone called you, right? He said, nope. I'm just running my errands. I said, I'm doing my rounds, I mean. And I said, OK. Yeah, I am stuck here. If you he could help me, and he pulled me out. And unless my family watches this on Vimeo, they still don't know about that <laughs> because I did not want to have to admit. Look at this guy. So the HR test: what can be seen with a camera or heard with a recorder? Think about this being stuck in in the mud for a minute, and how when you're interacting with people, the reason your your wheels are spinning, the reason you're not getting out of there, is because you have no traction. And traction is friction, right? You have to have some sort of friction that is causing some resistance in order for you to get out of there. No resistance means you stay there. When you attack someone and you give them friction because you're wrong and I'm right, you're actually giving them traction to get the better of you. Did you know that? The better thing to do is to ask them questions where you want to go a little further in what they believe. And instead of not fight, not flight, but you invite while you ask them questions. They, have, they are now, they have no traction. They can't get one up on you because you're being kind and because you're asking them about more about their position. But if you attack them, now they've got that traction. And that's what they're after. A lot of people live for the argument. They love the argument because they're good at it. They're very good. So when you're having a conversation, do not attack them. Think about the issue at hand. What are the facts? Known truth. Once you know the truth, you share the truth with others. What is the behavior? What is real? Not what do they think? Not what is their motive? And then you seek the truth. I would like to hear from you, Joe. You, you feel like our department never gets things done on time? I'd love to hear some more about that, because I would like to resolve it. No traction. No traction. He cannot attack you. You've taken that away from Joe, because you've said, literally, I'd like to hear more. Now, in your mind, you may think, I know our record. I've seen it, and we, we've only been late once in six years, one time. So he's wrong, but I'm not going to go there yet. I'm going to say, Joe, share with me why you feel that way. Joe has to calm down then because you're not attacking him. So you're getting the emotions to start settling down. All right, so we're going to do some activities here that you'll do sitting, sitting there, and I just want you to tell me what you think. You're going to change jobs, all right? Whatever your job is, you are... You've been the judge, right? You've been the judge. But the Bible says, judge not that ye be not judged. Now, I realize some of you that are listening who are very astute with your Bibles understand that there is a time and a place to judge. But the question is, what are we judging? So, do not judge this person's evil. Oh, this person's good. This person's terrible. Instead, you want to become a fruit inspector, all right? Because Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them, Matthew 7, 20. Um, so I'm going to give you some scenarios, and I want you to think about judging by the fruits, right? What are the facts? I almost hate priming it too much, because then you get all the answers right, and it's better if you miss a few, and I have to, uh, have to learn that way. Um, all right, so remember, we're looking for known truth. Test your skills as a fruit inspector. You're no longer judges, you're fruit inspectors. Here we go. You're driving down the road, and um, it's a hot day middle of summer, you're driving along looking at the beautiful Tennessee or Georgia or North Carolina uh, hills, got to include all of you here, and, uh, and it's so beautiful, and you see a bunch of people out there working in, in a garden, it's a big garden, and they're working away, and, and it, again, it's, it's very hot out there, and uh, you go, ah, that's nice, you know, I, I need to get into gardening more, I need to do more of that, but it's great to see those people, man, they're working in the hot sun, and then you see one guy who is sitting on a chair, and while he's in the chair, he's actually raking sitting down. He's hoeing sitting down. And you say, now look, I know it's hot. This guy literally brought a chair with him, because no one else has a chair. He's just going to sit there. What a what? A what? what do you think? What do you think about him? 
Lazy, yes, that's right. So we, we just got into what? His head. <laughs> We're judges, because we got into his mind. We know that the reason he's sitting there is because it is hot, and he wants to figure out a way to sit down while everyone else is standing up and working. And then you see, leaning up against the chair, you see crutches. And now what do you think about him? He actually came out to work while he was had crutches because he wanted to be a part of the team and actually help get something done. You now think of him as the opposite of lazy. You're, you're amazed at what a great, uh, what, what effort he is putting in. And you realize, ah, I was wrong. All right, here's another one. Now this one has been, I'm guessing that most of you have heard this one because it's really been uh, gone, um, it's been retold so many times. But I like this one and I think it helps us to think about our, our topic here. So, you are at the airport, okay? And um, you, your plane is not going to be leaving for another hour or so. you got plenty of time. You don't want to be starving, and you like more than just airplane peanuts for your six-hour flight, so you say, I'm going to get something to eat first. But you, uh, you get a few things that uh, you're going to take on the plane, but then you say, I, I want to snack on something now. So you get a bag of those famous Amos chocolate chip cookies. You say, I'm just going to munch on these things here while I look over my phone and scroll, because i got time, and I, I, just want, I just want something to hold me over. So you get, these, you get these chocolate chip cookies. And you look around for a place to sit, and you see that uh, there's, there's uh, one guy sitting at this one table, and you think, I, you know, the table's kind of large. He probably won't mind. So you sit down at the table, and you go, ah, oh, yeah, to just, you know, just relax. You know, I was rushing to get to the airport. And, and um, you get out your phone, and you're messing around with your phone and everything, and and then you reach in and you grab one of your, your cookies, you know, and you eat a cookie, and, and you're like, man, that was good, and you eat a second one, and, you know, and you're scrolling, and, and all of a sudden, you notice that the guy on, that's sitting in front of you, he has a newspaper, and he reaches around his newspaper and, and reaches in and takes one of your cookies. And you're like, what? what? Are you kidding me? Like, and you think, well, maybe that's just a, maybe I'll be nice. I don't really don't like people putting their hands on my stuff, but I'll be nice because... You know, maybe that was the only time he'll do it, but I'm certainly going to keep my eye on him. So you keep scrolling, and then you go, and you get two more aggressively. You know, you're like, oh, okay. And uh, you're thinking, I should say something to him. And then he reaches around, and, he, and then he, he grabs another one as well. And you're thinking, okay, I, I'm going to say something to this guy. And then you decide, no, I'm not going to say anything. I, I should say something. But you do the dove, and instead of being wise like a serpent and harmless and saying, sir, excuse me, I, I, if you want some of this, I can maybe buy you some if you're hungry, but I don't really appreciate you putting your hands on my, in my cookie bag. Um, but no, I'm just not going to say anything. Maybe it'll be fine. And then you notice he goes, and he, while he's reading his paper, he goes and reaches and grabs some more. And you're like, okay, I'm going to be really loud this time getting these so he gets the message. And you put your hand in there, and you rattle the bag around, you pull them out, and he just looks, looks down at you and then goes back to reading. And you're scrunching and crunching them as fast as you can. Maybe this will wake him up. There's, I, I don't want to say anything, but I should. Notice, you should say something. If you had that nexus of the two, you'd say, Sir, can we talk about this? This is not right. And so finally, you, uh, the guy then reaches in, he grabs the last one, and he gets up to leave, and he, he takes the bag and throws it in the trash. And you say, of all the nerve, he took the last one. What is going on here? And then you say, well, you know what? I probably should have said something, but who cares? I guess I'll get another bag anyways. So you go and you reach down to pick up your bag to get going, and you notice that in the top of the bag is your bag of those cookies. <laughs> and you replay the last 10 minutes, and you realize this man had incredible patience with me while I was grabbing, rudely grabbing those cookies out of his bag. Should have said something. Had I said something, that man would have had a chance to say, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, ma'am, but those are mine. And then I would have said, oh, I'm so sorry. I actually had something similar to this happen to me once. I went to a place at a, at the, at a mall where they had, you place your order, and they put your order on the top of this really high counter, and then you go and you eat in the food court. So I didn't see anybody around. I ordered, I'll have French fries, whatever, whatever. And so they're going to make stuff. They go, and they put the fries on there first, and then I think, okay, they're, they're waiting to make the, whatever the rest of it is. So I'm like, I'm hungry. I'll just take some of these. <laughs> right? Then she puts down the next thing that wasn't my order. And a man who had been watching comes up. And he takes it. 
And I said, I am so sorry. He goes, I knew what happened. He goes, I knew you thought it was yours. It's fine. I said, I'll switch with you if you want. He goes, no, no, it's fine. All right, how about this one? So there was an example of where we went to Dove. We should have gone to the nexus of the two. How about this one, road rage, all right? You're driving down the road, and you have a, you have a brand new sports car. I mean, this thing's beautiful. You're just so proud of it. You're like, you're like man, and I'm glad I'm going up this mountain road because it is so, it's, it's a perfect chance with all these curves, and, and, and I'm right on the edge, and I can, I, can, I can live my life, not worry about someone saying, oh, you're too close to the edge. You're going to go off the cliff. I can just zoom up these streets. This is, this is wonderful. Uh, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm all about. So you're driving along, you're driving along, just, you know, and you're going around, and the view is beautiful. You think it's great. And then you come, and you know, there'll be curves, and then a straightaway, and then more curves and straight. And then you come to a little section of a straightaway, and you see that coming, around, coming towards you around the corner of the next curve is somebody that is just driving erratically, right? And you're just like, what? Is this person drunk? What in the world's going on? And so you decide, well, I don't, I don't know what to do here, but I'm just going to make sure I, you know, I just get, I'm going to pass them really quick. I'm going to pass them really quick because the less time I'm beside them, the more. So I'm going to, they're coming toward me, I'm going to pass them. That's what I'll do. Even though they're kind of swerving, you're like, this is, I mean, I got a sports car, I can handle this. So you, 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 you go even faster. And then as you come up toward them, they're still kind of, kind of swerving. This lady rolls her window down, and as you go past her, she shouts out, Pig! You think, whoa, I mean, she's the one to talk, right? She's sitting here like she doesn't even know how to drive. The reason I'm going fast is because I want to get past you. And while you're sitting there just dwelling on what a problem this lady is, you decide, you're so mad, you got this adrenaline going like, man, I can't stand it when people have road rage. It's just ridiculous. What is wrong with that? And then all of a sudden, around the corner, in the middle of the road, <laughs> is a pig. And you have to make a choice. You either go off the cliff and die, or you go to the right and uh, go into the and crash and, and try to not hit the, hit the side of the, the mountain, or you can hit the pig. And you decide the pig and the mountain, either way, is going to be a problem. So out of reflux, you just swerve and you hit the side of the mountain. And you think about the fact that, you know, I probably shouldn't have made an assumption about that lady. I probably should have listened because she was telling me what's coming. Um, big problem. All right, here's another one. So you are at your retirement party. I know some of you here are too young to be even thinking about this. No, let's change it. You're at, a, you're, you're at just a, a, a company gathering and, uh, because you celebrated some landmark. You reach some point and everybody's going, yeah, we're going we're gonna to celebrate this. Now, everybody knows that you love chocolate cake, right? You are known as the chocolate cake connoisseur, that's your thing, is chocolate cake. And um, you notice that um, there, is, there, is, there are only two pieces left, because you've been talking to some people, and there's only a couple pieces left, and um, you notice that one of them is way bigger than the other one, right? And you think, man, I got to get that chocolate cake. I really, and, and uh, you said, people know that I'm the chocolate cake connoisseur. They're, surely they'll, they'll leave it for me, but I, gotta, I need to go over there. And you see someone that goes and cuts through line, and one of your coworkers, and grabs that piece, the big piece, and leaves this little tiny thing. And this person knows. They know that chocolate cake is your thing, and then you're sitting there going, great, now I'm going to get that little. So what are you thinking about this selfish person? What do you think? They, they care more about themselves getting it than you, right? Unbelievable. And then that that lady that grabbed the cake comes walking towards you. You're going, well, well great. I'm going to give her a piece of my mind. For and she says, I knew you loved chocolate cake so much, I wanted to make sure you have this. <laughs> you say, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I, I, thank you. I really appreciate that. It is so easy for us to make assumptions because in each of these cases we just looked at, you think you know what's going on in their mind, right? You think that the, uh, the lady shouting pig was being mean to you. You think this person was being selfish, right? And going back to famous Amos, you think that person's being selfish as well. And the gardener was being lazy. All of these things are where we read their minds instead of looking at the fruit and saying, is it possible that my assumptions are wrong? Is that possible? Is it possible? The Bible says in Proverbs 18, verse 2, fools find no pleasure in understanding. 
don't want to know truth, but delight in airing their own opinions. The King James puts it this way, but that his heart might discover itself. The things that I feel inside, those are the things that I want to be made known. I want to know that my way is done. I want to discover myself. I don't really care about discovering from you. I don't care about that. And so this is very biblical. Now here's the science side of it. Cognitive dissonance. Many of you know what this is. It says this is why people get upset when their beliefs are challenged. Watch, watch what it talks about fear here. A mental conflict occurs when beliefs are contradicted by new information, like we all just had in these ac activities. This conflict activates areas of the brain involved in personal identity and emotional response to threats. To what? Threats. Notice, you feel like something's wrong. You feel like someone's attacking you. Someone's being mean. Someone's being unfair. The brain's alarms go off when a person feels threatened, there's that safety thing, they have fear, on a deeply personal and emotional level, causing them to shut down and disregard any rational evidence, any rational evidence that contradicts what they previously regarded as truth. Do we see this in politics? Do we see it in religion? No matter how many scriptures, I know, I'll go home and pray about it. Well, the Holy Spirit told me, don't worry about these verses, because because I'm saved. You've heard this kind of a thing. I don't, the Bible is great, but I know that I'm saved. I don't need to worry about what God says. Very dangerous. That's cognitive dissonance. All right. So the summary of this. My goal shifts mid-conversation. I want to go talk to someone. It could be about sharing biblical truths. It could be the gospel. It could be about in our everyday lives. Because remember, people are watching us all the time. Remember, our, our, our lives are always a sermon. We're, we're always preaching a sermon while people see how we act. So my goal shifts mid-conversation because I don't like what I assume your motive to be. Here's, what, here's how most people, if they put this on a chart, they would say, this is, this is why I do what I do, when I get impatient and lash out. Someone does something that makes me mad, and so I lash out. They think there's three steps. Someone does something... That thing they did make me make, makes me mad, and then I act like I do, and I scream at them or I do whatever. They're missing a step. Here's the real thing. Someone does something, you then make an assumption. It takes you one second. You make an assumption about what they did. Then you feel bad, and then you act out. So this second step right here about the assumptions that we make, that is where the Holy Spirit can come in and say, hold on, hold on. Your brain has an intellectual side, it has an emotional side, and God has given it a spiritual side that in many of us is dead. We want that spiritual side to be alive by feeding it on the Word. Amen? So the solution, when you find yourself making assumptions, focus on the H. I'll give you the, I'll give you the secular answer, and I'll give you the spiritual answer, both of which are helpful because science always aligns with what Scripture says. Focus on the HR facts. I need to go talk to somebody about X. You all, this will happen to you in the next month. You'll have a conversation like this. Focus on the facts. What is it that you're wanting to share, not what is wrong with this person as you share? That's what we want to avoid. What could be seen with a camera and, or heard with a recorder? Focus on those things, not that person's character. But look what the Bible says here. Let not, Philippians 2, verse 3, this is even better. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others as better than themselves. Do you realize if you took one year and you said, I'll read the rest of Scripture, but this one right here I'm going to focus on and I'm going to ask God to help me live. Just this one. Just this. Your life would change. If you interacted with people and you said, Lord, remember Paul said I'm the chief of sinners? If you said, Lord, this person's better than me. That's supernatural. Do you naturally do this? No. You have somebody tell you, you know what, I'm sick and tired of your attitude. You always only care about yourself. Do you stop and go, this person's better than me. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for putting this person in my life. I appreciate they're correcting me. This is good for me. It's refining me. And we don't do that. We want to lash out again. Now, this is from another book I really like called Ministry of Healing. Some of you have heard of it. Very good book. It's, it quotes Philippians 2, 3, which we just covered. And then, now listen to this. I love this. I love this. I put this online one time, and it went viral. Thousands of people uh, saw this. 
Cultivate the habit of speaking well of others. When tempted to complain of what someone has said or done, praise something in that person's life or character. Wow. Just think immediately, what's something good about this person? They're really good at that. They've been helpful in these situations. Even though right now they're being very rude, think about something good about that person. Ministry of Healing, page 492. All right, we'll end it with one more story, and then we will close with prayer. Before I tell the story, I want to remind you that we have a potluck afterwards, and this afternoon after the potluck is part three, where we will get into when you're starting the conversation, what are the steps? These are biblical. They're also backed up by science. Our final story, and this one comes to us. Stephen Covey um, talks about this one time in experience that he had. So he got on a subway, and he was sitting there going to an appointment in, in New York City, and all of a sudden comes on the subway a man with his two young kids. They were probably like you know five and, and seven years old, maybe seven and nine years old. And uh, they were, he said, they were just running around. They were running all over the place. They were grabbing people's, um, they were grabbing people's newspapers. They were being all uh, you know, hyper, running around, acting crazy. And he said he let it go on for a while. But he thought to himself, you know, this, what, this dad is a terrible dad. Why is he not doing anything with, to help to calm these kids down? I mean, they're being very disruptive. And he said he just thought, you know, I should say something. So he was doing that whole thing about it. Should I say something or should I let it go? Should I say something or let it go? And finally he decided, I'm going to say something to this guy because he, is, he, he cannot be this blind. This is really bad, okay? He, they're disrupting. These kids are disrupting the whole subway. And so he, he got really impatient with the guy, and he said, Sir, can you not do something? Your kids are tearing this place up, and you're just sitting there. Like, you don't see it. Now, before I share with you what happened there, I want you to think about this, this principle. We judge others by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. Have you ever been in, have you ever been in a hurry in a grocery store, and the person in front of you in line has got 400 coupons that they're going through, and then they drop them, and... They should be more organized. What is wrong with this person? But if it were you, it would be like, oh, oh, poor me. i got to get these coupons up. Please be patient. We judge others by their actions and ourselves by our intentions. So when Covey lashed out to this man and said, can you please get your kids to calm down? This is ridiculous. His friend, the, the man, father said, you know what? You're right. I, I should do something. He goes, but my kids, they probably don't know how to act because we just got, got through burying their mother a couple of hours ago. And he goes... I think they're just trying to figure out how to, how to deal with it. And he goes, they don't know how to act. They don't know how to deal with it. And he goes, you know what? I guess I don't know how to deal with it either. And Stephen Covey said immediately what he thought was, how can I help this man instead of how can I attack this man? Right? So when you and I are interacting with other people, I want you to think about this and the assumptions that we make because the only way we're going to reach someone's heart is when we approach them with love. That is the only way. If we attack them and we judge them and tell them how bad they are, it's just not going to work. You and I have a message to get to the world. Amen? Amen. The way we're going to get the message to the world is with Christ in us so that people are listening to us and they don't say this, well, if you're in heaven, I don't want to be there because I've heard someone say that. There was someone at our church years ago that stopped going and I went out and did a visitation. And she said, if those people are in heaven, I don't want to be there. And you know what happened? She would not forgive, she would not forgive these, there's about five elderly ladies that she was one of them originally. There were six of them. She goes, I just can't stand them. If they're in heaven, I don't want to be there. And I said, I understand how you feel, but, you know, let's talk, because we want you in heaven. Wouldn't forgive them, wouldn't forgive them, wouldn't forgive them. So I went out of town with my family to, on a trip up to New England, and I kept calling her to check up on her because her health wasn't doing really well. How you doing, Gloria? Her name was Gloria. How you doing? She goes, fine, fine. I'm trying to you know, go through some clothes and whatever and all this kind of thing. One day I called her during this one week that I was gone, and this was years. She had years of saying, I'm not going to forgive those people. And she said, Carl, i got to tell you something. I said, what? She goes, I finally decided I'm going to forgive them. It's not worth it. I want to be in heaven. The next day she died. You and I, brothers and sisters, we have a message that is powerful. It can change lives. And if you want to be a part of that, let's, those of you who are able, let's kneel together now as we pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. All of these scientific studies that show these things to be true are just taking them right out of Scripture, even if they don't realize it. Even the atheists, Lord, who, who think they're studying and learning new things, you told us thousands of years ago, and we thank you for it. Lord, I want to ask for right now group forgiveness of some of the ways that we've treated people. There are people right here even today that, that know they've, they've said things to their spouse they shouldn't have. They've defended themselves in ways that are not very kind and not very dove-like. And Lord, we also have among us some people who have been silent when they should have spoken up. They should have said something at that board meeting. They should have said something when they saw some things happening that weren't right. And Lord, we need both. We need the wisdom of the serpent, but also the harmlessness of the dove. We don't possess it. Not one person in here possesses it naturally. We ask you to give it to us, because Lord, our days are short. Your son Jesus is coming soon. We see the signs all around us. We are never going to convince anyone that your message is real if we are mistreating them and debating and arguing. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Bless us as we go to have a fellowship luncheon, and bless us as we come back again to see more from your word. In Jesus' name we pray.